Hello everybody and welcome to Immortal Gates of Pyre playing with Pyre. This is a brand new talk show where us, ZK, Dominic and Zard, we're just community members that decide to, you know, talk about the game we all love. Uh, so yeah, I'll let, uh, I'll let my co-caster, uh, my co-casters, my uh, co-hosts uh, introduce themselves. Go ahead, Dom. So, as hinted, I, Zeke and I usually are the two main casters for the for the weekly threat game weekly tournament for Mortal Kids of Pyre, the official one. And that's mainly what I'm doing with this. I have been doing commentating for a bunch of stuff for a long time, but yeah, that's mainly what I've been doing with Immortal. Yeah, our great caster with the most experience among uh, the three of us <laughs> at the very least. And uh, our third guy, uh, Zard, the guy behind the camera that for once is going to be right in front of it. Hello, you... everyone. Yeah, I've been, I do all the camera work and observing for the Break the Game Weekly Tournament, and I enjoy doing it a lot. It's like, I get to capture, like, each and every little interesting thing that's going on in the game and just kind of, like, show it off to everybody. It makes me really happy. And this time, I'm here to actually talk about the game this time. So, that makes me pretty happy, and I'm super excited to be here. Exactly. So, what is this talk show about? Uh, there's already a few Immortal Gates of Power talk shows. Uh, of course, there's stories by the power happening tomorrow at noon, and there's a, which is all about the lore of Immortal. You can ask all your questions about lore there. And then we have the uh, Pyreside chat on Fridays, which with some community members that go there or some members of the Sunspear Games team itself that talk about Immortal Gates of Pyre. And Playing with Pyre is another take on the talk show where we mostly talk about the game itself, what happens, what units fight, uh, who's going to win which battle, How? what happens in tournaments, why did this guy win, is it this composition, is this better micro? You know, it's a mix of everything. And we just want to talk <coughs> about the game itself, this amazing battle strategy game. And yeah, and I'm going to introduce myself, which I forgot to do. As uh, Dom said, I'm his co-caster, his most regular co-caster for the Break the Game Weekly every Saturdays. Another one of, another, another immortal show since they happen all the time. And yeah, besides that, I'm a big fan of Star, I'm, I've been a big fan of StarCraft and other strategy games. And once Immortal, once Immortal shown its uh, feathers, I just said, oh, I got to play this game. And here we are now, uh, over a year later, and all of us loving it, and made a pot made a talk show to just talk about it endlessly. I suppose. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. That, that about covers it. Yeah. I'm talking endlessly. Name, name one thing we can do better. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. Since I can't I do most of the time. Show. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <sighs> well, before we get started, since. Uh, I know most people watching now are obviously people that know Immortal, uh, but maybe we'll put it under sources and people might wonder, what is Immortal? So Dom, want to tell me what exactly is Immortal Gates of Pyre? All right, Immortal is an upcoming strategy game that's made by people who got really fed up with StarCraft and StarCraft 2 and decided to make their own game. Yeah, that's a good free sentence explanation. I love it. And uh, Zard, do you want to add to that? What makes, uh, what they, actually, what makes Immortal special, Zard? What? Uh, what? makes immortal special i have to say that i think it's just the sheer amount of thought that goes into every little thing in the game like i ask a lot of questions and i haven't found any disappointing answers yet and i ask a lot of questions yeah like it's really hard to hammer home just how much detail just goes into the game and it makes me so happy because every time there's like oh i turn over a stone oh there's something new and interesting there that i haven't thought about before and well, it helps in your case. You have free access to the Dev Q and A channel. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. For context, uh, we have an immortal Discord, of course. Well, not ours. Sunspear Games, the creators of the game, have an immortal Discord, and on there <laughs> we have rankings for how many people talk. Uh, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty well advanced in that ranking. I'm number six. So the only people ahead of me are the devs, and uh, Zard. Zard is about five thousand, uh, five thousand points ahead of the nearest per pursuer behind him. Uh, he is a... I think I have over 20,000 messages or something in yeah, the exactly. server just talking and asking questions. Questions are my favorite, man. Yeah, so Zard having 50% more than anyone else. Of course, Dom is not a slouch elder. Uh, I'm He's number a... 16. Oh, 16. I was going to say top 30. I just Actually, checked. You just checked. Actually, okay. I, I was going to say top 30, but okay, top 20. You're getting there. And Yay! actually, Yeah, and Dom's actually been participating even more lately after... Uh, I don't know why, actually. Why have you been participating more lately? Just fell into I... more love? 
I'm not sure exactly what it was, but somewhere around the point where Zol became viable, I started actually really taking, like, really getting into it more. And then I started getting into it more. And also Zard helped. <laughs> yeah, so... Zard, if... helped, Zard helped me with the right track in terms of attitude and how to just broad strokes how to approach the game. He basically just went, okay, what do you like? And I was like, well, I like quick stuff that goes around and is <laughs> makes my opponent's life miserable. And it's like, okay, well, Ikors do it then. It's like, yeah, Ikors are fun. Okay, play Ikors. And then the calls became the meta. But for a while, <laughs> Ikors are viable. Okay, but there's actually a transition into Ikors. So, like, you can actually transition oh, into... Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So, so you go for the Zakal meta, and then typically... When you okay, we are going to talk about the meta for sure. Let, let, let's keep that for a bit later. Uh, before we get into all of that, let's talk about uh, other stuff that makes Immortal special. Just before we get started, uh, Zar, can you tell me the basic lore of Immortal in, say, like, five sentences? Like, Dom did a really short recap of what Immortal is. Now, give me the recap of the lore in five sentences before we go into the meat of the gameplay itself. Okay, let me see if I can do this. Five sentences. So, go. Five. A long time ago, there were there was a elder civilization that did a lot of cool stuff. Unfortunately, war happened, and they all fell. They all they all stopped working. They had these giant constructs called gates, and with their fall, the gates fell, and their legacy was lost into the relics of a time. And they had, and 10,000 years pass, new... I think three sentences so far, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to count yeah, here. Yeah, take another sentence off. That's been run on for a while. <laughs> Keep playing, Zard. Yeah, okay. Well, three sentences left. Let me, let, me, let me finish. And so, new new nations emerge. New, new races come out. New world powers start. And then the gates wake back up. And... <laughs> then new alliances are in old alliances and enemies are in question. Everything hits the fan, and everybody starts squabbling in order to have control over the gates in a very unknown world with lots of things. Okay, that's one sentence with like five ends. Let's go with you. You have two sentences left to describe the, the current state of it. Yeah, Simu's not proud of you either. <laughs> <laughs> two sentences to, to, to say what the current state is current state of the lore of the world of like the yeah lore wise world whatever okay factions that exist and yeah, please talk about on. arwen crafting your last two senses describing what this is okay so two worlds you have nuoth and shale on shale you have karath fighting against jora and tamatra on nuoth you have the iratek and the aru who are in tension with each other and the gates ignite and all of these factions start to discover them discover each other Okay, let's say that was five sentences. Dom, can you do better? I, I know. I okay. Know you so, <laughs> ten thousand years ago, ancient civilization dug too deep into greedily in space time, awakened big Eldritor. Eldritor killed them all. Ten thousand years later is now. There are two planet. There are three major, major worlds. Two of them, one with tree tree cat people, two hive minded tree cat people, Aru and Iratek, and then you have angel. The on Shale, you have angels that have humans in an authoritarian empire and then freedom fighter humans, and then fascist humans, and all three of them are fighting. And then they get teleport, and then the gates open up and they get to talk to each other and kill each other. Yeah, that was, more, con that was more concise. I, I guess Zara went a bit more details. But, yeah, good introduction. I just wanted to make it, if not, someone has no idea what's going on, it's important yeah. to know it's cat tree people <laughs> and angels ruling over humans in an authoritarian dictatorship. I think yeah. those are the most important things for people who are unfamiliar with the lore of the world up to this point. Yeah, that makes sense. Angels fighting humans and stuff, and on the other side, cat plant tree people. Cat people. Yeah, tree cat people attacking other stuff. Okay. No, I like it. I like it. Uh, so, yes, this is the very basics of the lore of Immortal. Uh, yeah, Sills are part, part cat. That's just a part of the lore. To, not a voyeur. And yeah. So now uh, we describe a bit the lore. And of course, there was a lot of combat involved in this lore. So now, what we want to go into is uh, how do you actually fight? So tell me a bit about the gameplay. And uh, yeah, Dom, you can go first with the gameplay. What's uh, How do you play Immortal? What, what is the gameplay like? You, you can play use... Immortal using a mouse and a keyboard. Very good. That's a basic part. Mm -hmm. And the way it's laid out is basically you build 
you have a stuff you have a thing that creates units that grab the resources the resources get used to make other buildings which get used to make other units and then those other units go to kill your opponent's units and their buildings the goal of the game is to destroy all the buildings that make the units that get the resources but there's also units on the map that don't belong to anyone you kill them and then you get another resource that lets you throw superpowers around the map nice is our lots of resources <laughs> There are a lot of resources. There are three resources. Alloy, Ether, and Pyre. Alloy and Ether you get in the bases, and e Pyre you get by killing the units that belong to no one. There you go. Okay, uh, Zard, your, t your chance to uh, take a play on the gameplay. You can add on to Dom or start from scratch for yourself. Okay, you get money. Use money to build a base. Use the base to build an army and smash it into your opponent. And in the process, you get giant red crystals that let you smash your opponent even harder and it's really cool and you're both trying to overpower and kill the other dude's army and then kill their base afterward in order to like find, finally deliver the final blow to your opponent it's super engaging yes smashing it's exactly okay. santa claus so we've we learned now that whichever one of us goes second is the better eli5 explanation yeah well i mean yeah i, I get it, right you just listen to the first was like what could i improve here uh yeah yep and this is all i'm gonna take and then i'm just the host i'm just like yeah i'm not even gonna try to answer i'm just gonna move on to the next thing uh but yeah I, i'm gonna give it a try as well it's a strategy game done Okay, strategy game play, played live where armies smash against each other. One sentence is all I'm going to give you guys. Uh, but yeah, we can go into more details now since our podcast is more about fighting, about uh, what the different factions are. So let's go into the very first faction. Let's uh, change screens. Man, I prepared <clears> some stuff. <laughs> so this is uh, an Immortal Crick reference sheet, which of course I made uh, with my wonderful wife, Avril, who also helped me make uh, these uh, graphics for this whole thing with playing with fire beautiful beautiful mode because i would not be able to do that on my own so pro tip marry a graphic designer exactly it's a very or useful. become a graphic designer it also works so uh let's talk a bit about the buildings themselves we have croft and croft is a pretty straightforward a pretty straightforward uh, tech tree uh so you have your basic buildings are the i'm sure you want to take it away with uh, the different tech buildings i'll let you go i see it in your eye in the sparkle oh yeah yeah, so the way this works is you, you kind of got your tier one. It's a bit of a tiered tech tree here. You have your tier one, you have your tier one and a half. So you have your Legion Hall, which you use in order to produce your low tech units. And then you have your Reliquary, which unlocks a few more low tech units and their upgrades. And then you can go to tier two, which has the Soul Foundry, which allows you to build like two tier two units or which are a bit more specialized like you have your specialized anti-air you have anti-light you have your absolvers you have the switch or your zone control and then you have the upgrade building that goes with that which is going to be the house of the fading saints which allows you to upgrade all of those units so you have stuff like dervish speed dervish being the anti-light unit that Karath has access to it's really 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 fast we'll talk about that a bit later and then you have castigator range which is your anti-air range you have uh, the hallower which gets unlocked which is kind of your dislodger for crop and then you have your tier three and your tier three and a half and so your tier three is your angelarium which is kind of your just your flying units essentially it's a bit like a starcraft starport where you build flying units and you go out you harass people you have your air superiority units the sentinels you have the um, you have the harassment units and the warden, and um, although I'm kind of thinking about it, you would Orzum normally has the scepter to replace the warden, but I don't know if that counts as a harass unit in the long run, even though it's a harass. Unit. Yeah, I think we're gonna skip. Right now. I think we're gonna skip those uh, eccentricities with the vanguards and all that for now. Uh, so yeah, yeah. We, have, yeah, we have the basic texture right now. Uh, basic tech tree being, if you come to StarCraft, it's very Terran-like, right? It's very straightforward. Yeah. You have building, second building, third building, uh, final building with the units go representing their tiers. It's pretty straightforward. However, we can go to the second faction, which I'll let uh, Dom present, which uh, has a bit of a different structure. So Aru is... I mean, if we're going to use a StarCraft analogy, it is like Protoss if they had the layer upgrade but not the hive upgrade. 
I like it. So you start out with your standard, just you can produce an infantry production structure, the altar of the worthy. And then from there, you have to upgrade your main build and the grow part into a god heart in order to access everything else. But after that, everything can just be accessed. You can get your your amber room for the vehicles. You can get your your bone canopy for the air units. You can get the blood veil in order to get more advanced infantry stuff. And then the only upgrade from that point is the bone canopy. You can then get another building for behemoths. So that's sort of like your tier 3.5 type thing, the deep nest. And that is basically that. The only other thing would be the neurosite, which unlocks everything across everything. Yeah. And... Currently, it does it across the board. There's some... it, All, all the stuff is subject to change, and some discussions have been made about whether the neurosite's going to stay as across the board or going to be a proximity thing that's up in the air. So, for now, neurosite just unlocks advanced tech across the board for everything. Uh, yeah, good point to mention that, of course, we are in pre-alpha, so nothing is set in stone in any single way. And we still want to talk about it. We are fans of the game, of course. We're not affiliated with Sunspear. But talking about this game and seeing how it goes, we don't know where it's going, but devs are very open about how it's coming along. So we know stuff, for example, the Neurosite is a building that will attach itself to to the production buildings, or at least that's what they said at the last time. So there's a lot of different things that you can learn by joining a Discord, of course. Uh, Discord, do you have a link to it, I believe, in the chat? Oh yeah, I have an iPod. Yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. I uh, so yeah, feel free to join the Discord, but I think all the viewers are already from the Discord, so that's fine. What I want to talk also, about... Martha, oh. Look, go for it. As far as I know, the Karathan are the only factions of what has been revealed so far of the plans for design for later. Karathan Aro appear to be the only factions that are operating on StarCraft analogy rules for tech tree. Yeah. You're always going to come along and cause issues with that. What's, what's, what's the Jordan tech tree like? I don't know how to describe it. You'll just have to look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that sounds like what the devs would say. Or a smiley face. One or the other are two favorite things. I was like, here's this obscure strategy game from the 90s that you've probably never played. That's what it's based off of. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for that. Like, oh. it's like you know, we got you got your Proton, so you got your Zerg or Zerg Protoss Harbor, your Terran, and then it got just the ECS from Empire Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so, Empire Earth from Earth 2150. So Empire Earth is different. Earth 21, the Earth 21 XT series, and it's like, wait a sec, that's not. It's like. That's the thing. Trees from NES games. Let's see them. See, I can't wait for the Sim City, like uh, like the actual game Sim City, instead of building a Sim City. It's just going to be Sim City the game, and you just have to build your own city, and you have to win the game somehow with it. There, there's a lot of so ways. So kind of kind of like the humans in Grey World. There we go. Okay, <laughs> you have an analogy immediately. <laughs> Thanks, Dom. Well. Yeah, so, so so far we went through the tech tree a bit quickly, uh, which we don't really need to go more because everyone can figure out when to get access to the game. Let's talk a bit about the units and something that I, that I personally really enjoy is the fact that every single unit has a certain role and that's a bit how they plan to balance out the game. Uh, sorry, Dom, you want to go up on that? How they plan to balance the yeah, game around so that? Yeah, actually something I, I mean, to bring... And this is one of the things I'm happy this is not sponsored by Sunspear Games, so I can talk about other games. Oh, yeah. I actually have experience with this kind of design. Cool. So one of the games that I've spent a lot of time doing commentating for and playing is called Zero K. It's a base. It's based on Total Annihilation, and which is, for those of you who aren't familiar with early 90s games, think Supreme Commander, but before Supreme Commander. Anyway, long story short, fan game based on the same concept, but they did the same thing with the idea of unit roles. And the concept essentially is that you group your units into roles like, like in the case of zero K, of raiders and riot units, which will, like raiders, which are like fast, run around, kill that stuff, you ha and are difficult to deal with. But you have riot units, which then deal with them by some kind of splash damage or some kind of area, like either they hit splash damage or they fire really fast, accurate weapons that you can't dodge, or they just spray shots everywhere, and then you, those get countered by skirmish units, which just have long would beat them by range but not so much by damage and similar idea whereas in immortal the roles are different but the concept is the same you have each all the units across the factions there you have your frontliners which will protect your generalist units which do most of the damage which also help out with zone control which allow you to maintain presence on the map but then dislodges will counter the zone control but how they do that varies in some cases you have howlers which are very straightforward they come in they attack from range they just win by range but then you have arc mothers who come in and so far they'll set up this 
area of effect where your units just take way less damage, and so they can just rush right in. And winning and via Dark Swarm. <laughs> basically, yes, yeah. winning via Dark Swarm. <laughs> and just completely different approaches to the same concept are common. And like I said, in my experience is you're okay. You can you can get a very wide range of designs while maintaining a sense of learnability because you know this is what the unit is broadly good at and so this is how i should be using it based on my opponent's composition yeah i will say that's one of the stuff things i really enjoy is just the fact that it's very clear this unit this is its role that's how you're supposed to use this unit once you play the game instead of oh well uh, this one does a bit of everything but they all kind of do and well yeah good luck <laughs> having yeah, the role defined helps that, a lot yeah and that that is helpful and also it makes it so you have a lot of room for design. It just makes the design a lot wilder. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but zero K is mostly just one faction and everyone has access to the same or So it's weird. I tend to I refer to it as semi symmetric because technically you do have access to everything, but it takes so you start out with one of eleven factories that you can just place for free. Okay. And they all have completely different, mostly mobility types. So you have a different, couple different types of robots, a couple different types of a few different types of vehicles, a couple types of air units. Though those are generally considered more of a secondary or support factory. But you have all these different types of units, and you had access. Each factory gets you access to about eleven of them, eleven or twelve of them, from a big pool. The thing is, it's a lot easier to just build. I think build units that will increase the build speed of that one factory okay. or build assisting like assist buildings that will then essentially add another build queue to the factory rather than building a whole other factory of a different type so you okay. can access everything but it takes so much longer to expand what you have access to than it does to simply work with what you currently what you started with yeah. you can expand it and generally it's a good idea to mid game you're just not going to have it's not like you have access to literally everything Okay. In a feasible way. Yeah. So if anyone's more is interested in zero K, you can find more on YouTube on Dominic's channel. What's it? What is it again? Your YouTube channel? It's Shadow Fury three 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 is the channel. I haven't had a chance to post anything in a while. I've been busy with a few other things, including Immortal. But there's years worth of videos on there. So yeah. if you want to see how the game plays and has played throughout its time, then yeah, you can check that out. It's also free to play, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's completely free. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure. I'm actually. I know that the that the Immortal devs have played that game and took a lot of lessons for it, which we can see in the gameplay here. Uh, although, let's say each faction here is limited to a lot more units. There's only like 12 to 14, which is good for... Yeah, about as many as a factory has in Zero okay. K. It's like, it's yeah. a similar idea. The There's... So yeah, like it, it broadly map... It, well, the I, broad design ideas of things like roles and so forth do map reasonably well. No, that makes sense. Cool, cool. Uh, Zard, I, I, think, I think we're ready to talk about the units itself. Well, we talked about craft first and i mean i know it's already you want to talk about ro so i'll let you uh, speak about your favorite ro units and talk to me about about how you can make a, a fun composition by well, talk a bit about the units themselves as well but tell me how you can make a fun composition with that with uh, these type of units by looking at their types and all that as well okay well easy way to do that is well you have the zakal and the zakal is a frontliner and therefore it goes in front and then behind that you can stick mass hunters and then, so you kind of get this composition of mass hunters and zakals, and you can run them around the map and stuff like that. And then, what you can do is you can go, okay, well, what's what's good with that? Well, you want some kind of support unit to go with that. So the interesting part about Aru is there's actually a lot of support units you can go for. You can go for spellcasters immediately if you really want to. You can go for bloodbound to run around the map and be horrifically annoying and play a super mobile comp you can play resonance which are your zone control kind of like a terran siege tank from starcraft you can if you're playing mala you can play incubators which literally are just like I, i'm gonna fight you and then you i'm gonna hit you with free units that come from my units uh, and you can kind of like push your way over enemy compositions. It's like one of the most satisfying things ever because it's just like this wave that creeps over the enemy army and then all that's left are, ke are like a bazillion Keedles afterward and then the incubators that are scuttling away after taking a very nice trade afterward. So like those are kind of like some of my favorites. And then you can also add thrums if you want to play a mobile style, have them fly around a bit like a mutilus being really annoying. Like 
really annoying. <laughs> like, there's it's really hard to kind of like sell how annoying a, thr a thrum can be. I mean, if you've played uh, StarCraft, you know how Mutalisk can be annoying, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, dude, it's, it's so close to Mutalisk too, only they don't have Glaive Worm, they have a, uh, they have that attack speed buff instead, so they'll go into a mineral line and then they'll just eat the mineral line and then leave. And then you're like, oh, well, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. It'll kill you. So there's, there's, there's a numerous number, like, there's numerous different archons you can go for. And the Trident Tech Tree helps really facilitate that because you kind of pick which way you're going to end up going with your composition. You can also add, uh, as I was saying before, you can also add Ikors to your Zakal Mass Hunter composition because Ikors are anti-light units. So you, your Zakals are frontliners, but they're also anti-armor units. So therefore you add anti-light to the anti-heavy units in order to kind of like cover all of your bases. And then you run around the map with that, which is a decently mobile composition as well. You can split off your Ikers in order to po poke your opponent in multiple different places and just generally pick your opponent to pieces with really highly valid units. See, it's really see what I really like about all this is that you describe how with only 12 to 14 units, how many different compositions you can get to. And on top of it, you even add in the stuff like, oh, okay, there's immortals that actually change some of the units. There's Vanguard units, which are upgrade units, but and to just change stuff but yeah dom tell me a bit about how immortals what are immortals in the gameplay itself actually well we should step back a step yeah, so part it. of the way that the game's been designed again to make it actually step back another step <laughs> big difference with immortal gates of pyre as a game overall for those who are not familiar of course is that there's going to be factions added over time this isn't new for strategy games if you've played the dawn of war series that was done with dlc but it is unusual. So part of the way that the design has been built to account for this is that factions exist in families. And in the families will typically have some similar, or plans, the idea is they're going to have similarities broadly. I think tech trees are, you can correct me on this, but I believe tech tree is kind of where things get similar, yeah. but then units are completely different. Yeah. And then within each faction, you have multiple immortals what the immortals do is operate like sub factions so each immortal will replace a couple of the units that the faction comes with as well as replacing a couple of the or adding a couple abilities because the immortals also act as a kind of global caster if you're familiar with the command and conquer generals or battle for middle earth games you'll know that you'll understand, you kind of see the idea of like commander powers it's the same thing with immortals you use pyre the pyre allows you to do things like place defensive turrets make your units faster and attack faster make then there's stuff that's more faction specific like making some a building almost impossible to kill or putting a support building out that that heals your units and gives them extra mana or make your opponent not able to see so wow. that that's that each fun. of those things that are immortal specific except the except the turrets and making units faster that is general that everyone can do that Yeah, no, that's a that's a pretty pretty good uh, description of the different immortals and the different powers. Top of it, I just want to add the different vanguards that change to units. But yeah, having mm -hmm. faction families, as you said, has the different uh, as a similar tech tree, or at least from what we know. Of course, it's not released yet. Free alpha, blah 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 blah. But yeah, I'm curious to see how it's going to develop exactly. And I think at this point, we should probably be ready to jump into a game and actually show off the different uh, things that happen. So we'll be heading into a game. We already set it up a bit with a... Uh, oh no, they can see the password. You would be able to join. And yeah, launching the game. 2v1 game. Shadow Fury can take us both, I believe, in him. In the 2v1. No, we're, doing, we're doing god mode testing, right? That yeah, was the plan? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah, course, right, Zark? Right, Zark? going to jump on me. Yeah, 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 that was the plan. <laughs> so yeah, talking about faction family so far, uh, we're going to be in the mortal selection screen in just a moment. Maybe I'm, yeah, there you go. Hmm. Mine didn't launch. Mine, I'm seeing like three dots and stuff, so I'm sure it's going to launch very soon. And yeah, the faction ability, so we can talk a bit more about the different immortal abilities while we're waiting. Go back to this screen. So yeah, immortal abilities itself, can you uh, sort of expand a bit on what the immortal abilities are, will you? Uh, more generally, or you want specifics? 
I need to go more generally. Like, what what type of immortal abilities does everyone have? And then you can go into more specifics afterwards. Yep. Okay, so everyone has the ability to construct towers on the map. What I mean, a tower does is it's a giant meat shield that doesn't do a lot of damage, but takes a little while to kill. So therefore, you can kind of put them up on different places on the map in order to essentially control different points. And therefore, it creates a very concrete feeling of like, I control this spot because I can see everything that happens right here. And therefore, like fighting over tower positions on the map gets really important. So the other thing that they can do is they can infuse, which is basically a way of catching your opponent when they make a mistake. And what infuse does is it gives you a 30% attack speed bonus and I think 30% movement speed bonus. And so therefore your opponent's out of position and you have pyre and they don't, well you infuse and you just murder their army and then you go back to doing whatever you were doing before. Only this time with an army advantage. And so if you pull that off enough times, then that creates a lot of interesting positions where you're ahead and you're allowed to do kind of whatever you want after that point. So therefore pyre ends up being really important. Um, more specifically, when it comes to pyre abilities, what you'll find is that well, I think uh, it starts to diverge a little bit. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm going to stop you, and I think we're actually going to show them in game what the different pyre abilities are, just uh, to make yeah. it a bit more interactive here. So I am in the immortal selection screen. Uh, let me know if it's still lagging right now. I'm hoping it stopped. If it did, uh, I'll have to figure that out. It's still lagging. Still lagging. Okay, so maybe we won't be able to show off too much gameplay. Uh, but yeah, let's just. Let's just get it started. Hopefully, it's gonna it's gonna settle a bit. I see no more drop frames, but unsure about it. Okay, it's a bit better. But yeah, I'm gonna go into game and hopefully we'll be able to show off. Ah! It crashed. It crashed entirely. Aww. Aww. Yep. Welcome Free to Free Alpha, where you can make an attempt and it will crash. Be the yeah. way it goes sometimes. It is. Um, okay, maybe I'll actually just leave the game because it seems to be crashing a bit. Uh, the stream. Oh, Westo can still hear us, so that's good at some point. Westo, I will yep. accept your help to help us, uh, to help me stream better and not to uh, lag anymore. Yeah, it's a little tricky trying to set it up in a way that's. I mean, it's. Oh, yeah, for the stream, Westo. It, it is the stream I want you to help yeah. me set up. Because <laughs> I am not a pro like you. And uh, thank you for watching. Yeah, we'll just keep talking a bit more. Uh, I guess we won't be able to go into gameplay. I do have some, might be able to go into some Twitch VODs instead of the tournament play and all that, which is still pretty interesting. Uh, but for now, I guess we won't go 100% into the game, but I'm sure we can still talk about interesting stuff. So Zard, you were getting started on describing exactly how uh, how immortals, how, how the different immortal abilities. So I'll let you go on up on that. So it kind of diverges a little bit. For like, for example, on the cross side, like you have Orzum and Ajari, and Orzum has a ability called Pillar of the Heavens, and he just kind of like slaps it down in the middle of the map and says, "Mine," and like like a small child, "Mine," and then like n the problem is is that it's a really powerful small child that says "Mine," and you are physically incapable of actually taking that area away from him unless you have like an overwhelming force. There's just like what are you gonna do it gives a 30 percent attack speed bonus to everything in there it's like having a 30 percent bigger army just standing on like one spot on the map well what really... you do what you do is when he tries to slap down mine you put your hand in the way and by your hand i mean your entire army yeah exactly and the pillar slimes into it and just vanishes because it's it takes damage from the units it hits yeah, so you end up in this like interesting positional play, like play where when one person screws up, somebody uh, like positionally specifically, then you end up with uh, you somebody loses. So yeah. that's that's fascinating. Um, yeah. You have Get you, right you also have on the Orzum side the ability to fortify your citadels, which for Orzu, Orzum, those are your towers. You got. You, that just means your towers go everywhere. You haven't known what it's like to have a map constricting in on you until or you have experienced Orzum Tower, because Orzum Tower is everywhere. It sees all, but there is nothing you can do. You can try, but he will just fortify the structure and his army will show up and murder you. So, therefore, 
you end up in a positional struggle where if you let Orzum start taking inches, well, then he will take all of the inches and you lose. So, so, so what I'm hearing here is, Zard, you've had difficulty playing against Orzum in the past few weeks. Is that it? Let's see. No, <laughs> actually, I, I wouldn't call it difficulty. I'd just say it's punishing. Hmm. Like, it, it's like if you know exactly, like, if you're able to keep track of where your opponent's army is, Orzum is not going to get much out of it. He, he's going to, like, you're going to be able to slap him away repeatedly and then take over the map yourself, and then Orzum, when he's stuck in his base, isn't very happy because he's not able to do anything to you, and you're kind of able to expand across the map, and he has to break out of his base, and he really wants to be, like, making offensive moves on the map, taking the space, etc. Because in order to take space, you got to have space first. So it seems to be like you're talking about the, your more regular gameplay, so that's mostly 1v1 that you play as hard, right? Yeah, I mostly play 1v1. Although I think this extrapolates well to 2v2 Oh, it definitely well. does. It definitely, definitely does. And yeah, talking about like 2v2s, there are weekly tournaments as well. And yeah, we just had a 2v2 tournament, so let's just show the scores of the last tournament. Not the most exciting thing. <coughs> but yeah, we've had the, your most frequent 1v1 one opponent, uh, Magical, win it again. And then... Yeah, playing as Magical is brutal, man. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we can talk a bit about the... the Basically everyone's most frequent 1v1 opponent, just about. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, if, if we talk about the different uh, players in Immortal, Magical is the Magical most... Uh, Hydra used to. Yeah. Like, actually. Yeah, Magical is the most active by far, for sure. But yeah, these are just the results of the last tournament. So talking about the top players of the past few... You know, of the past... Uh, in the latest meta, the top players have mostly been Magical. Uh, of course, we have our other strong players like Santa has been uh, improving rapidly. Oh, we love talking about our great players. Yeah. 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 yeah tell, tell me a bit about Santa. What what makes him tick, uh, Dom? You you've seen him tick. What makes Santa tick I, is just... raw amounts of harassment. Like it's like. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Like, oh, that was. If you are playing against Santa, you will have <laughs> Dervish in your mineral line, guaranteed at some point after four thirty into the game, like. <laughs> At all points after 4.30 into the game. Yep. Like, it, you just got to have it set up such that you don't Build take... Build static... We got to remember, build static defense. That is the most important <laughs> thing. I was saying it during the tournament, but I'm saying it now again. More to remind myself than anyone else, because <laughs> I never built static defense. So like, no, 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 no. Build static defense. It's super important. Here's the thing, though. When you're playing against Santa, he gets dervish speed, and then your static defense is more like temporary damage on his dervish, and then he just runs away. So it's like, he'll run in and snipe four of your alloy line, yeah. and then you leave, and then you're like, what did I build static defense for? Well, see, that's actually something I've liked, I've liked about the latest meta, where people are learning to wall off. Like, like the, the solution to it seems to be mostly <laughs> learning to wall off well. And like players are adapting their play to that, right? Even though we all come from a long line of art of uh, strategy games like uh, StarCraft or whatnot, and we just learn to improve upon that. Like we're just really improving, and now people have finally started to wall off. And like Magical is the prime example of that, having figured out all the walls everywhere, basically. Yeah, playing against. Although it's really what's really interesting is in QBA that walling turns out to be less simple because it turns out that. If Aru goes for his Zakal timing and you have used your initial buildings to wall off, then Aru doesn't really have to trade with your army. They just walk up and hit, the kill wall. your buildings and then they leave. And then they go into an Iker transition. And all of a sudden you're down on army and you have Ikers showing up in your base and your wall has been killed. So therefore, it's really not simple to get those walls up because they could just die. So yeah, you kind of got to scout what your opponent's going for. If your opponent is going for a pile of Zakal, well, you don't wall off until after the Zakal phase of the game and you're confident that you can defend those Zakals. So Dom, just in last week tournaments, which we casted, say that was the case, yeah. like the harass just <laughs> being overwhelming and everything? Yeah, it didn't seem like, I mean, Magical was with Santa Claus. Yeah, so true. the yeah. person who the best seemed to have the best idea, according to Zard, of how to deal with this was on side and doing some of it themselves. Oh, yeah, we saw absolutely disgusting thrum play. <laughs> and that was, uh... Oh, those thrums. That was, like, the one Lost Province game where they just kept, like, those three thrums that survived from this set of thrums it kept being more and more thrown into the main base, smashing Pigeon Wrench's main base. 
Never Dude. let them do anything. Thrums is the magic number. Because three thrums is exactly how many you need in order to two shot a worker. And well, it wasn't just it was like three thrums were left, so it was constantly yeah. they were getting reinforced, and then there would be a few left, and by the end there was three, but there were ten most of the time. Just oh yeah, no, I, I, I remember that. But it's really in, I, I mentioned that because it's really interesting because good Aru players, you'll often see just three thrums come out of their base, and then you can often tell like the caliber of an Aru player by how long do those three thrums last. Mm. And good Aru players will make three thrums last for five minutes and taxi the entire freaking time, and it's annoying as heck because what's the numbers on that? 240 alloy and 150 ether in order to yeah. tax your opponent for five minutes. Yeah, that really like really, really strong. Yeah, we really start to see like the strength of multitasking coming into the game, even though <clears throat> we're still pretty early. And often enough, I've seen your post about having difficulty dealing with that, plus like the straight up pushes as well and everything. Uh, but yeah, what? So like we're talking a bit about matchups right now, right? So we're talking about Croft versus Aru, where we have Aru that's very, very dominant with the with the Frums. Well, not necessarily dominant, but. Let's talk a bit. Let's let's back up a bit and talk about what the Croft versus Aru meta actually is right now, uh, because I think this is the one show where we can talk about it. What is the meta? And yeah, so let's start off with Dom because Zard, I'm sure you have lots of thoughts. But let's let Dom uh, take this one away because he just casted the tournament. And yeah, let's talk two. Uh, let's start with one v one, of course. Even though last tournament was one v one. Yeah, last week was two was one v was two two, but one v one before that, it was, it wasn't too different, honestly. The Dervish were very important. Zakal started to fade a little bit. They were the go-to unit for, for Aru basically in every matchup. They're getting early 10 Zakals. But th that that shifted recently in, I want to say the latest patch, but they didn't really do much to change it. It just, it just shifted. People got better at dealing with the Zakals early on. So it became more of an understanding that you go from Zakals, transition into Mass Hunters. On the Karath side, they're was still quite a bit of Saoshin and Sapari for Ajari. For Orzim, I think part of it was that Orzim had Zintari Hallower as another shift that happened, which then meant the Zakals had less to work with because the Hallowers had ripped apart the Zakals. And that's how you started seeing Thrums come back, <laughs> just to deal with that because none of those units shoot up. So basically, yeah. the, it's it's hard to really pin it down, but that's roughly the state of it was in the last 1v1 tournament. Yeah, no, sounds about right. What do you think, Zard? About that, I or think, I think that not much has changed on the Karath side. I think the entire puzzle behind, it, like putting a meta together, has been figuring out how to put together Aru to tools in such a way that they can actually contest the Karath tools. Because the compositions that Karath can put together are like relatively straightforward. They kind of bulldoze you. They will run over everything you build if you let them. And so therefore, Aru players have been going like, okay, well, what can I build and create with my more fragile, higher damage density units that are mm -hmm. that is actually going to be able to threaten a Saoshin, Sapari, Zephyr, uh, Shari composition that we end up seeing in that matchup. Yeah, honestly, so, honestly, that's really what I was expecting. Like, Aru doesn't seem like the faction you're supposed to fight straight up all the time, whereas Croft is, you know, you build the big ball of Croft Death Ball and just bulldoze your opponent. Whereas Aru, to me, seemed like you want to go around your opponent. What's really interesting is that er, like, you end up having these like switches that flip, I think, in the matchup at this point. First switch is when the Aru gets out their first 30 supply or so of calls, and they get their upgrade. And they switch it on, and they go run into the, the Karath player's face. It's like a skill check. Can you survive 10 double damage calls? Yes or no? A lot of the time... If I'm playing against someone who's uh, not on the caliber of uh, some of some of the really experienced playtesters, the answer is no, and they roll over and die. So, like, there, there's, there's definite skill checks that happen. And then what happens is the Croft player ends up getting Sapari Saoshin and gets a couple of Zephyrs, and then all of a sudden they walk across the map and start threatening those call. And those call player has to go, okay, well, how do I survive this to the best of my ability? How do I get a third base while I'm having this Karath army barrel down at me? 
And the other part is, is it's become a much less straightforward, just barrel down at you at the same time, because two Sapari are extremely good at killing mineral lines, or sorry, owl lines. Like you run two Sapari into a main base and two Sapari into your opponent's natural. That's four Sapari and you have a maximum of killing all of their workers. And they're also trying to deal with like this frontal assault at the same time. So if you can survive that, well, then the Aru player eventually gets to incubators. And incubators are disgustingly good, it turns out. They make it such that the Saushin's intervention and the Magi and these things suddenly just aren't enough to prevent the Aru player from rolling over that person. So basically, what you're saying is that the meta keeps shifting on its head with like new discoveries. Like, incubator, how in, long, how in long is the incubator? Match. Yeah, how how long has the incubator like met like meta? How how long has the incubator like be seen this powerful? Let's see. I think two three weeks now. Two, it basically weeks. started when I Magical. got fed up with the fact we didn't have a late game comp to reach in QBA that actually worked, and I was like, yeah, let me throw pretty together pretty some pretty theoretical pretty. stuff to see if it works. And then it turned out the incubator actually served that. So <laughs> kind so, of perfect. So you just. Uh, more. Yeah. Uh, so kind of like how I figured the Whitewood Reaper would be theoretically useful against the calls if they were complete. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. kind of. Although in this case, it wasn't. It's so actually much. useful because incubators are more complete. Yeah. 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 Exactly. There's there's actually like the element of completion that happens, right? So. Yeah. yeah it's like Santa just said. Like a month ago, the incubators were just a meme unit, more or less. You're just like, well, mm -hmm. you have no reason to build this. And... Yeah. But yeah, also you were talking about the meta. So like the Croft Endgame feel strong to the Aru endgame, right? So how do you actually deal with that? How, what's the solution that uh, the top players have come up oh, with? Let's yeah, go with Dom. Yeah. I'll let Dom answer a bit, Zard. You've, uh, you've got your quota. Uh, how do you think, Dom? How, how have you seen it, or not really? The main thing I've seen has basically just been Master Hunter Transition, which often comes along with Spellcasters, though that varies. Because if you're playing Zal, you have access to the Red Seer, which can just melt Karath units. If you have Mala, you have access to the Dread Sister, which has an easier time rooting units. Both spellcasters have that, but Dread, Dread Sisters are a much wider radius. And so you'll often see Dread Sisters be used to root Thrones or Sharo and then pick them off with Mass Hunters. But the key part of it is that the same tech that gets you the spellcasters gets you the attack speed upgrade for Mass Hunter when they use their offering ability. <coughs> That's the main thing I see being the late game option, is just get dozens of Mass Hunters, have a bit of support with Zuccal's casters, and occasionally thrum harassment and then use that to just power through take get rid of all the powerful karath air and hope you don't get melted in the process because that's a lot of aoe that's coming at you regardless yeah yeah so the shard are uh, are pretty strong is what you're trying to say here yeah <laughs> yeah they are and aru doesn't have quite the same like, red seers are close for damage but not quite anywhere near as powerful yeah yeah so I'm gonna throw go a bit out on a limb here and say that the actual Aru late game comps are not <laughs> actually used all that much because they're too expensive. Okay, like Schemeth so, Mask? Okay, like, well, like, what okay. is what is the ultimate army? What is the ultimate okay. Aru army? That's that's ultimate what I want to know. Aru army is like nine resonance complete with some incubators with behemoths not as an instigator like we used to use them but as zone control to pile on top of your zone control that is resonance because basically the problem that resonance have is they get kind of steamrolled if they don't have any support so therefore you're going to get you want dread sisters you want like four to six behemoths a pile of resonance incubators blood wells and then your mass hunters are going to be your alloy sink and then the alley and then those kind of run around the map and be really obnoxious because a fully upgraded mass hunters do a crap ton of damage like what about zol though because zol doesn't have incubators yeah what does zol do but red seers do damage oh red seers are yeah so powerful. plague is interesting because it's really good in places where you're kind of having a standoff where it's static and neither side really wants to move all that much mm. if that if you can for here's an example if an orzum 
player is sitting on a pillar that's just begging to be play to be plagued. Yeah. Just wants the Red Sears just like wants to walk up and plague a pillar. Yeah. Focused army. And so like it's the ultimate in terms of like dislodgement tools. However, when the army when the opponent has a really mobile army, then the Red Seer isn't nearly as good just because they just walk through the blood plague and they don't yeah really how much damage yeah, does I mean, the blood plague do them too how much damage mm -hmm. exactly the blood plague like the ultimate the blood plague 10 percent of their hp and damage per second for how many seconds for five seconds plus three linger time which means that they eat an entire blood plague that's 80 percent of their hp okay does it include shields or not it doesn't include shields okay. no Oh, still. But when it comes to Sapari and Zentari, those are mostly HP, and those are mostly the HP you're trying to chew through anyway. So mm. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you kind of have that. You have a you have a Colix as well. You had you probably had two or three Colix just to poke at your the enemy army because the Colix do a disgusting amount of damage. Mm. So my question is on that part is, what stops the Aru army from actually getting to that stage? So yeah, you could. You can just go on it. I'm, I'm sure Dom also has the army, the idea on that. Charu timing. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard because the problem is, like you, like Zart said, it's, it's extremely expensive. You need four or five bases with ether in them in order to be able to pull that off. And when you're trying to do that, when Sharu are melting your army, if you're not careful, when I mean, you have to survive getting through Sharu timing with Zakal Mass Hunter and some Thrums, in order to be able to get to the point where you can start building the behemoths and resonance. Yeah. You can add Aurochs as well in order to deal with Sharu, but they, That's true. But even the then, the Aurochs only does about, so much. Yeah. The interesting part about that, I think, is that it's... Aurochs are also countered by Castigators, because Castigators can three-shot them. Hmm. And so what you end up with is this really interesting kind of dynamic where the R the Aru player is constantly fishing for their Arox for times where they can commit their Arox in order to wipe out a pile of Sharu. And the Kroth player is trying to like protect their Sharu really well. Yeah. So if the Kroth player screws up, they basically lose just all of their Sharu and then they just get steamrolled. But if the Kroth player manages to reach like a critical Sharu count of like eight or more, that's the point where you start being unable to really get rid of all of the Sharu. Well, then the, the Aru player is going to have a really hard time because there you can only eat so many Oz strikes before you die. Yeah. So there, so yeah. is there a way to deal with late game Sharu? Is there a way to deal with the like if you get to the uh, max health composition, but like you were saying it's mostly the timings that stop that from actually happening. So is there a so, way, to, did you figure out a way basically, or Dom, did you see I a way to happen? In some way? way to deal with an army that contains 10 Sharu and a pile of ground army. Yeah, no. So, yeah. It's yeah. tough because your biggest, your biggest ground army option is resonance which gets melted by Ostrikes. Yeah. Wraithbow might be under, it might Wraithbow be underrated assuming? here. But they don't deal with a hardcore committal by the Karoth army. I'm just thinking as as a way of adding a little bit of damage for when you send in some other unit you know, to actually deal like Fast Hunters, Thrums, Arox to get rid of all the Sharu. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. probably not because I would have to drop it below a threshold. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. So the Arox aren't. Well, yeah, he's saying in chat that Arox aren't cost effective on your side. Uh, so you got to figure out a way. So. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Three Arox kill a Sharu. Yeah. Sharu's cost a hundred a hundred and a hundred alloy and hundred fifty ether. So you're trading one twenty one twenty for one hundred one. I, I think I think though his calculus includes that at least one Sharu one Arox is going to die on the way to the to the Sharu. However, the Arox do splash. So if you get the magic yeah. shot, it's worth it. But splash. also, if you manage to stagger your Arox to go in. Yeah. If they're like at a good interval, then you can actually kill a Sharu with two Arox. Yeah. Oh. Oh, so three involves one of them dying in the process of getting there, you mean? Yeah, so so they have a damage over time. Oh right. Right, right, right. Yeah. Magical will hardly yeah. disagree with me, but I've had success with Arox to kill Sharu. No, I'm I'm quite curious to see what uh, what comes up next in the Crawverse Arrow, because as you said right now, 
it feels like Aru versus Scarf. Aru's finding different timings around different things before the Sharu, or before, as you said, the critical mass of Sharu. Before critical mass of Sharu, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that that's the difficulty right now. So it's a lot about timing attacks, right? That's the Aru, Aru strategy right yeah. now, find the right timing. Yeah, if you manage to keep the Sharu counts low, you will eventually reach a point, I think, where you can just over just overrun the crop army because mass hunters end up being so damage dense hmm. because with their offering upgrades yeah double offering that how, how much attack speed upgrade like 30 40 percent or something attack speed upgrade so it's like it's they go to dealing like 12 to 13 dps each and they're like two supply oh, wait and that stacks confused too so you bet you almost get double damage yeah. at that point yeah you double you get at that point. disgusting amount of damage out of your mass hunters and infuse infuse a yeah. powerful spell <laughs> luckily at that point you're supposed to have more mass hunters than infuse can hit right hopefully <laughs> yeah i think i think at that point though like if you infuse a group of like 15 20 hunters i mean that's enough yeah like, still an extra 50 percent damage over the course of the infuse okay. yeah so, so last subject i'm still going to stick on craw versus aru and we can cover aru versus aru and craw versus craw next week on our next episode hopefully uh Craw versus Aru, in, well, Aru versus Craw and Craw versus Aru in 2v2. How does that differ? Does it differ in any way? Or Because in the last tournament, what we've seen is people were playing Mala with Orzum, I believe. that's That was yeah. the most common dual composition. What reason is there for that? Um, I mean, if, given the fact, like, the power spikes that happen, where Craw has a bit of a power spike, then Aru has a power spike with the calls, and then Craw has a power spike, and then Aru has a power spike with incubators, and then Craw has another power spike with Sharu, and then um, and then Aru will have another power spike with, uh, I guess, Behemoth and Resonant, etc., and just like large numbers of incubators with their army. Then what you'll find is that they end up covering each other's like weaknesses decently well. That's so cool. that kind of translates into the 2v2 space. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, of course, Aru has the Thrum, and I think the Thrum is really effective in a 2v2 space because one person can cover the ground army and the other person can go Thrums and pick the opponent to death. Okay. Dom, do you have anything to add to that? I, no, I'd have to agree. The main thing I've noticed, the last week we saw yeah. a lot of, of coordinated harass. Yeah. Just Dervish, Thrum combined doing a bunch of damage. And that was another thing. Oh, man, I'm blanking on it, but I remember there was another specific synergy that came down. Was it use of blood well? It's... Ah, I'm blanking. But it seemed like there, was, there were some specific synergies between what you could actually do with some of Orzum's abilities on top of some of Mala's abilities to just make the other even stronger than they'd normally be. No, no. Oh yeah, one of one of the interesting interactions is the fact that the blood well will refill your uh, allies' Sharu. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought it was. Mm. That was that. Yeah. yeah. There's another that's... one with blood rain, and blood rain will refill your allies' magi and Sharu. With the that's what it was. Yes, the blood rain is specifically what it was. That was the synergy I was noticing. Thanks for reminding me. Yes. Well, yeah. So you just have like really disgustingly like, cost cost efficient yeah. interaction with just those couple things. No, oh, that's cool. Well, in any case, I think we're about ready to wrap up the show. I think that from now on, we're going to concentrate more on the meta. So we're still discovering what we want to do exactly with the show, as if this is the first episode. Mm -hmm. So we started off the episode by talking a lot about uh, what is immortal in general. But I think I really enjoyed the discussion on the meta, and we'll have other guest people. And I, I see some people in chat, I'm sure some of you would be interested in guest starring as well. Uh, so yeah, we'll be in touch as well. Let, let us know. And do you think we should do a um, couple questions from chat before we go? I, sure. Sure. If anyone has a question in chat, uh, we'll answer them. I don't them, know but... if IR already has a question. If are, Asking if Absolvers are only good for zoning fragile melee units, so are they pretty much useless against Aru? Yeah, I can take that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I... yeah, so the whole idea about the Absolver is it's a zone control unit, right? You want to be able to plant it down and it will control an area. Problem is, is that crop compositions are extremely mobile right now. They wander around the map and they kind of engage with you over and over and over again. So therefore, crop doesn't really have a lot of spaces where they go, oh, I want to sit down in this particular area and control it. And 
when they do want to do that on the side of or zoom they just drop a pillar there so they fill in that niche with pyre abilities rather than actually going out of their way to build absolvers yeah okay uh next question well thanks for the answer sorry who is the who is the most handsome dev obviously it's walter i don't think there's any other possible answer for anyone <laughs> Oh Obviously. yeah, good question. So the podcast schedule is planned weekly, and yeah. the time is still up in the air. So this seems to be a good time for a lot of people. Yeah. So we're either do it like it's gonna be in the evening of the in the evening of the Americas, uh, where they're this time maybe two hours earlier, depending. Uh, we'll figure it out. We'll we'll talk among ourselves to just exactly decide what we want to do. Uh, Westo likes this time, so maybe he can guest star eventually as well. Um, I like this time. It works for my schedule. <laughs> Same. Okay, sounds good. Maybe we'll keep it at this time then. Uh, other question: How do you feel about Zard the meme head being on the show? That's my other favorite meme of this. But you know, Zard, I don't think I'm on that meme. Zard is a very nice meme head. Of all the meme heads I know, he's the nicest one. <laughs> Which is why I'm fine with having him there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, is, is, is right. On that note. I think okay. we'll be done with questions. No, just plug ourselves. So I'm ZK. You can find me on Twitter at ZK012. Uh, <clears throat> Dom and Zara, do you want to plug yourselves? Yeah, I'm at DominicCasts on Twitch, Twitter, and Shadow Fury 333 Shadow on YouTube. Most of my stuff is 0K, as we talked about earlier. So I am gradually shifting into more immortal stuff, which will be, will be coming. That's, that's been, I've been, I'm experimenting with that. My name is Zardasil, just at Zardasil. You can find literally everything about me by typing that name into Google because I'm the only one out there currently. So. <laughs> yeah, no fair. <laughs> just having names like that is not fair. Uh, and yeah, we'll be doing playing with power every week from uh, now on unless uh, we found we unless something uh, unexpected happens. And yeah, thanks for for watching. Once again, uh, we please stay tuned for other shows from Emerald Gates of Power from the official people of Sunspear Games, which happens tomorrow, uh, playing with Pyre at 12 EST or 9 PST. Stories or... by the Pyre. What? Stories by the Pyre. Stories by the Pyre. Darn it. It's okay, we're not we official. We're playing with Pyre. We're not, we're not official today, it's fine. Uh, tomorrow, the <laughs> Stories by the Pyre at, uh, at uh, 6 p.m. Yeah, 6 9 your time. 9 a.m. PST, 12, a 12 p.m. EST. Sorry, DT. Oh my god because daylight savings time happened i know i hate it this weekend yep so a little confusing it's actually going to be 5 p.m central european time because of daylight savings time right yeah thanks for saying 6 p.m so it's an hour earlier same for friday's fireside chat which will be 12 30 pacific 3 30 eastern and now 8 30 in central european time uh, for the next two weeks like yep. and then europe and then it's central european summertime and then that pops forward an hour again so yeah just do bear that in mind. Yeah. If not, uh, feel free to also join the tournament this Friday, uh, this Saturday. At, I'm not even going to try the times. So just go on our Discord. Discord is here. Everything is there. The events are there. Yeah. So yeah, the events, just... are, the events are handy because they just tell you in your own time zone. Exactly. So don't worry about anything. In any case, that's going to be it for us. Uh, thank you for watching. I'll probably post on my YouTube as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, Zard. And see you next time. See ya.